Okay, you ready? Yeah, what are we, we talking about? Gold cards? Yeah, something? I got okay, I got, I got some notes. I got wrote down some... You got notes too? I mean, I just wrote down some things that maybe I should... I feel like we should mention at some point. But, I mean, what is that if not a note? One, two, three, four, five, six... It's seven words. Man, I wonder how many of them I can guess. We could do like a hangman, but for the words themselves. Okay, here we go. Um, I think one of the words is gold. No. Okay, I got a head. I think one of the words is sometimes. No. I think one of the words is... Oh, I got a body now. I got four more guesses. You're at two. <sighs> Hangman's a grim game when you think about it for yeah. children. Mm -hmm. It's also um, not how regular hangings work. Usually you start with the whole yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy. Um, uh, I, mean, I should look at my notes and just say some of the most common words in my notes. Huh? That looks our, chunky. <laughs> Unrelated. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how this works. Is it not okay. supposed to be chunky? I don't know. Give me that. It's a big mug. It's not. It's actually a pretty small mug. Hold on, I gotta nutmeg it. Oh wait, but I gotta put. I gotta. I gotta. I'm gonna juice mine first. Are you gonna juice it up? You're mm -hmm. not even gonna try it first. You're just no. gonna just go straight I'm to boots. Try it how it's supposed to be. Wait, I thought. I, I that's what I thought last time, but then I was told no. It's not necessarily fundamentally an alcoholic drink. Sure. I mean, stir it up. First thing you're gonna do. Stir in the booze. Okay, so one of your words, hybrid. Yes. Okay. Ding, so, ding, ding. So I've got one of the seven words. You've got one. And I've got a head and a body. And you got a head and a body. Well, that's mm, not make me. One of the words, land. No, it should have been. That would have been the eighth word. <laughs> one of the words, signpost. Absolutely, it is. Okay. Okay. So I got three limbs left, and I got two of your seven words. That is correct. Card. No. I only have seven words. You think I'm going to waste one of them on card? <laughs> I didn't know you were going for efficiency of Okay, word. I guess actually I w maybe I should I should rethink this. I did write down gold cards as the heading. But that's not part of the seven that's words. That's not part of the seven words. That's fine, though. Okay, great. I, I will accept. I wish you had told me beforehand. I, I would understand. Have I understand. Two less limbs, okay. but you got to find out the hard way sometimes. I got two limbs left. I know two of the words are hybrid and signpost. That is correct. You're good at keeping all this in your head, huh? Is one of the words monocolored or single color? Is color one of the words? Color is a word. Okay. And oh, card is a word for sure. <laughs> okay, I'm back to three limbs left. Got, Ar arm fell off. <laughs> I've got hybrid, color, signpost, card. Uh huh. Three words left. Yes. We tell me are these words in a like cogent sentence fragment? Not anymore. I mean, the seven words arranged do form a like. There are some... It's not just a pile of words that you wanted to remember to, to, to say. It is a cogent idea. It's a list. Some of the items have more than one word. Oh. Is this a good game to play on the podcast? I was going to ask, is this the podcast? I mean, I started recording You're going to decide ago. later. You're going to yeah. figure it out. Um, Power. No. Okay, now back to having two, two limbs left. I bet it says hybrids don't count. Doesn't count. How do you want to submit that guess? Count? No. Oh, I got one <laughs> guess left. <laughs> da, 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 ba, ba, ba. Is splash or splashable in any form one of the words? I'm going to give you splashing. Splashing. So I've only got two words after two guess words left. remain. And one limb? One limb. Signpost. I don't think you would have wasted words on build around. Yes. I mean, we're just saying wasted words. Like, I really thought about this. You said wasted was, words first. You're right. Okay, never mind. <laughs> what, am I supposed to be consistent or something? It's one of the words, wheel? No. All right. And that's it. Right, I'm done. We've hung the man. Uh, and that's it for this episode and of Lucky Paper Radio. Happy New Year. Hope you all had a good time. I don't know if this was this the podcast intro of Lucky Paper Radio. <laughs> Now we start the real podcast. My name is Andy. I'm here as always with my co-host, Anthony, sipping on some Nogmatics. Yeah. Um, merry, happy year. You know, I didn't expect the amount of follow-up I would get on whether or not I tried eggnog and liked it. I would say four people separately were just like posted, DM'd, were like, did you like the eggnog? Did you did try you, the eggnog? Did you, did you like, you like eggnog? It? So we're going to do it live. I have not had it yet. This eggnog was delivered to me uh, yesterday. Delivered to you even? Delivered to me oh yesterday by... Friend of the show, member of the local play group, CubeCon attendee, Max. 
Max, the nicest guy alive, made I think many gallons. Of- this is this is how you know it. you've like made it as as a cube group when when you mention eggnog and and a friend shows up and delivers you a jar of eggnog. Yeah, I think that's it's how a you know. Of that's how you know it's real. Every year. He's so. also made jams and all kinds of stuff that gives us gifts. He's yeah. the real Abby, of upstanding the group. guy. Cheers. Cheers. Like yeah. we're, we're, so this is my first sip here on air. Live. Um, we're kind of I don't get stepping sick. on Ubercube's toes a little bit here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, Shout I, out to the Ubercube podcast. I we plussed are, mine up a bit. Yeah, you did also add some some flavor to yours. Here we go. Okay, it tastes alcoholic by default. I didn't was think Was there was. already booze in it? I didn't think there was. I should tell Hillary really quick. In case, oh, no. It's in my, she can't be drinking. It's all in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I got worried about my sober wife. It definitely has booze in it by default. Okay. Well, mine's Which a I, I didn't up. expect. Hey, you know what my my review is? It's good. I like it. It's delicious. Would you do you think that super ice cream juice is an accurate moniker? I mean, it's very boozy by default. So it tastes like it. It tastes like uh, we often will have this dessert, Hillary and I, where it's vanilla bean ice cream with these boozy raisins that she made once one year that have just continued to sit and get boozier they're intense it's they're just really like, like a, a nice brandy with a bunch of raisins i think it's a brandy. soaked for a, at least a year the first time before you try them yes, right a year, a year before we had the, the first time and now it's been many years this tastes exactly like that to me i'm getting the same like boozy notes and the same underlying ice cream ice notes. cream so, it's yeah. got a little bit of nutmeg so yeah thank you max for the nog and thank you to everybody who followed up I like eggnog. I realized why I never had it. My family just never has it around. Like I was looking around the whole holidays, like when I never had it no- because I never had it. When's my nog opportunity going to be? And uh-huh. it just never came up because You're looking, scoping out the place, checking the well, fridge. You know, Is it going to come up in I here? Mean, there was Is various drinks on offer. None mm-hmm. of them were nog though. So at none of my family events. So this could be your new thing that you bring to the family events. Is you could supply the nog. Maybe everyone hates it. Maybe that's why they don't do it. Maybe one year eggnog killed a distant family member I'm not aware of, and that's why no one has it, you know? Yeah, that could be difficult. Anyway, Happy New Year, like Anthony said. This is the first Lucky Paper Radio of 2024. Time is terrifying. And we're talking about gold cards. This is something I have been thinking about in my own cube designs a lot lately. And have we done an episode on gold cards, Anthony? What's the over-under we've done an episode that the title was something about gold cards? I don't think so. We're hitting that part of the podcast... Where we're hitting that part. I was there on episode 30, Andy. Well, I mean, the part where like I genuinely don't know if we've talked about something before. And also, it's been so long that there's absolutely no reason not to talk about it again, because I'm sure my thoughts have changed somewhat since we would have last talked about this if we did talk about it before. All right. So since it's the new year and we're doing bits now, how many times do you think the word gold appears on the podcast page? Okay. So I know it appears at least a couple times because we had Daniel on to talk about his all gold cube reading rainbow. Okay. That's going to be three ish of the mentions Mm -hmm. i'm gonna guess one other time so i'm going four what do you think the other time would be i don't know i'm I'm just i'm I'm accounting for one time i didn't all right great you're wrong the answer is one it's only one time and it's in your name no (laughs) we don't you forgot your own name the word gold doesn't even appear in the show description of the episode with daniel sure doesn't that episode was titled all that glitters i think it just says Commander Legends and a cube that glitters. That's all we got. Okay, well, I guess we've literally never talked about gold cards before in any capacity. So we're doing that today on this episode. And Anthony, that means we got to start with everyone's favorite segment of the show, which is Pedantry Corner, where we have to actually define what the heck a gold card is, because I don't think it is cut and dry at all. No, Magic is a very complicated game, and all these concepts get weird because they just make all kinds of weird cards. Yeah, so... I did I did, I did my classic number crunch on some of our cubes for the purposes of comparison and discussion. And in this number crunch, I broke these down into three categories. I have one category of true gold cards. These are cards that you need mana of two different colors to play the card at all. And that's it. That's the whole definition. Okay. <laughs> so it's a two color card. At least. takes multiple co- colors of mana and it's got a gold frame. I, Probably. I, I don't even want to say that for sure. I think so, <laughs> but I'm not actually certain. This is the defensive pedantry there, corner. There is no mode of the card that you can cast for one or no colors of mana. You need at least two colors of mana to cast or use the card at any capacity. Okay. That is what I'm calling a true gold card. I did count the hybrid cards, though, as I think your notes maybe say, I don't think of these as gold cards in any real way, except that they do kind of have a goldish frame, and people oftentimes group them in the gold section of their cube, so it's worth mentioning. But I did count those, but for the purposes of this discussion, they are only gold in one way that kind of matters, and that is like the signaling to drafters way, because I have found that even though 
you know, for example, uh, Manamorphose can be in a red or green deck. It very often shows up in the red green decks just because I think visually it just kind of looks like it's a card for you. Whereas if you're drafting blue red, even though it's a great card for blue red deck, I think some players might just overlook it because it looks kind of green, you know? It sounds like a dumb thing, but I think it definitely happens. Yeah, I think that hybrid cards serve a very different function in terms of the way that they are drafted, the way that they are played, the way they change the kinds of things that can happen in an environment, but they are very different in the, the actual impacts they have. So I think it's worth talking as part of this, but notably different. Yeah. Then I have what I'm calling in-betweens, and these are cards that are somewhere on the spectrum of hybrid-ish or have multiple modes where you choose one of the modes, which is kind of hybrid, but not. I'm talking about stuff like Lingering Souls. Off-color flashback, off-color kicker. Exactly. What about activated off abilities? Off-color adventures are a new off-color one. Off-color adventures, sure. Activated abilities. These are all things in here. Even stuff like Loam Lion, you know, it's not actually a gold card in any sense, except you got to mm-hmm. have force in your deck, or you don't have to. You're going to have force in your deck to play Loam Lion or Curd Ape, etc. So I've also counted those as much as I could. I may have missed one or two, but I did go through my main cube, the Bun Magic Cube, your regular cube, and the Neo Classical Cube. I don't think many of our other cubes... Like, looking at the gold density in, like, the Turbo Cube is kind of irrelevant. There's a lot of other forces that dictate the kinds of cards that go there that make it yeah. unique. Same for the Degenerate Micro Cube. I don't know what percentage of it is gold. It's a very different kind of question. So, those are the things I counted. What I didn't count is lands in any capacity, mm-hmm. which you could argue, is especially the lands that have activated abilities that cost two colors, like the two-color creature lands, are gold cards in some sense. I mean, you can never imagine playing a, for example... Celestial Colonnade in a deck that doesn't have both blue and white spells, right? Like, can you imagine any circumstance you would put that in a deck that's not playing blue and white spells? I can't. I mean, I like to draft it when I have a Celestial Colonnade and then some other off-color utility lands that let me activate the Celestial Colonnade, specifically in my regular cube, but that's an extreme case there. Yeah. Well, you want to be able to activate it, I guess. Yeah. yeah, If you're not activating it, you're not drafting it, because it should tap blue-white land, and if... Yeah, anyway. So I definitely think some of the lands you could argue are kind of almost spell adjacent, but I didn't count those for the purposes of this discussion. I also didn't count cards that are secretly gold, or secretly very nearly gold, which are cards that are mechanically not gold at all, but Young very, Pyromancer. Very, that's one of the that's ones the I have one. listed here. I have Young Pyromancer, Dreadhorde, Arcanist, even something like Wrath of God in a cube like the Blood Magic Cube. You, you can't really play Wrath of God in a non-blue deck in the Blood Magic Cube. It would be a bit of a trap. You know I've been enjoying playing that in Selesnia decks in various cubes lately. People well, just don't expect a Wrath in, in a mid-range deck. In your cube, you can definitely do it. I'm not sure about the Bun Magic Cube. In, in the regular cube, I did know things like Claim the Firstborn, which you could put in a red deck, but almost always is being used to sacrifice things with a black you card. You do really want it in a black deck. Ninja of the Deep Hours. I give a lot of things that are essentially signposts for the heroic deck that you're mm-hmm. only going to play with the other heroic color combination. You know, white cards, you only play with red mostly. But that's kind of a little triad you have going on there where it's like you got to play it with red sure, or sure, green. Sure. I didn't count any of these cards, so you know those very oftentimes will have similar attributes in the draft and gameplay to a true gold card, but are not actually gold and are much harder to, like, it's more subjective whether or not they are actually true gold. Because like you said, you put a board wipe in a green-white mid-range deck, I don't think you should ever in the Bun Magic Cube. Not in the Bun Magic Cube, but in a slightly slower environment with some similar power level where you got a lot of grindy things. That's not the important part, but I I feel justified in this. And in the Bun Magic Cube, you know, I've definitely had Rakdos decks with Dreadhorde Arcanus and Young Pyromancer, where they're not at their best, but they still, you know, pull their weight. So that's much more subjective, and I didn't cover any of those things too, but you should be aware of those, I think, in your own cube as well. If you have a lot of cards that are way better in specific color combinations than others, it's kind of like having... Ghost gold cards. That's a better name for them, like ghost gold cards. So the first question, Anthony, which we get asked this kind of question a lot, which is how many gold cards should I include in my cube? Which is totally reasonable to ask that question because I think new cube designers, they want to give themselves a template to fill in. It's so much easier to have empty spaces and then put them in retroactively. I'm going to go over the densities of gold cards we have in each of these three cubes I tallied up. But the first thing to mention is that you and I have never designed cubes that way. So we never set out to actually, like, you pro- You do not know the density of your cube that is gold cards, right? You could maybe guess. I could maybe have guessed, but I didn't know what, could, what density of my cube was gold cards. I could do some math. And again, it is really vague when we talk about, like, the hybrid cards and the split hybrid cards. It's going to vary a lot depending on how you measure it, but I could, I could figure it out roughly. But yeah, I mean, I feel like people ask this question, and it is a totally reasonable, logical question to ask, but I would just say that any any other discussion we have about it is 
kind of just a heuristic, maybe a reasonable baseline. The thing that ultimately matters is just how does the gameplay feel? Because it could be that you have... I, th I think these kinds of uh, red, blue, especially cards that are mono red or mono blue, but really function in that sort of spells matter deck is a great example where it maybe doesn't need a lot of gold cards to function. So in a cube, you could have, say, a bunch of Rakdos cards that really are the signposts that make Rakdos work and also a bunch of blue and red cards that really make the blue red spells matter work. And you don't need Sprite Dragon. Or you whatever don't necessarily, necessarily need, yeah, that one or two cards just to literally talk about, like, do the decks function when drafted normally? So, ultimately, the thing that is really important is your experience drafting. If you're playing a cube and it feels like the Spells Matters deck works and it is at the same proportion of power level that you want compared to other decks in the environment, then that's great. And if you want to tune that up or tune that down, you can feel free to either do that with monocolored cards or gold cards. But, you know, it's, it's not that you need three exact cards in every color combination to make it work. Yeah, so... We have never set out with a like goal post for number of gold cards, and you and I have also never had cubes where we maintain equal numbers of gold cards in each guild, which is very common, especially cubes used to be designed very much from yeah. this sort of like spreadsheet aesthetic where everything was supposed to be equal. And it's a reasonable baseline. Like if you have no other reason right. to do something else, just say like, okay, I'll do two of each, fine. But if you have a good reason, like I really like Selesnia cards, so I'm going to put five of them in just because I like them. That's a good enough reason for me personally. Oh, absolutely. I think you and I are definitely on the same page that what matters is the actual gameplay and there is no template we can give people that will create a good cube or that is normal in any sense because of all of the nuance in terms of how these cards are actually classified and actually play out. I will say, I think for a long time, I underestimated the importance of just the raw number of gold cards in my cube and how much of an effect that had on the draft experience, both in individual guilds and overall. I have no way to prove this, but my subjective experience has really shown me that while so many people think that the density of lands in your cube, fixing lands, it has a big impact on how many covers people play, and I have a whole article kind of rebutting that idea that I'll link in the show notes. We did a whole episode on it. So if you're not familiar with that concept or our rebuttal of that concept, uh, you should check that out. But more and more and more, I'm just so convinced that what has a much, much bigger impact on the number of covers people play is how many gold cards you include. Because you put a bunch of gold cards in, people are going to find ways to play them. Like, this is kind of that dumb thing I've said on previous episodes. Like, people are going to play the cards you give them. And we'll jump through hoops to do so, even if it means, you know making otherwise weird draft picks or weird deck building decisions because if you give them cards they'll actually put them in their deck and i think the density of gold cards has a huge impact on the number of colors people play and the color combinations that get drafted the most we talked a little bit about this on our cubesmith special episode where i mentioned that i would love signpost cards and like kind of power outliers specifically in green white and blue black to kind of signal the kinds of green white and blue black decks i want my players to draft I feel those colors do go underdrafted. Like, those exact color combinations go underdrafted, despite the fact that 99% of the pieces to make those decks work are there, but you never are at pick four in a pack, see a green-white card and go, I'm doing it. Like, this, I'm, I'm going to jump on this and, like, dive all over it, which is not the case for a lot of other gold cards I run. So Kasali Pride Mage in shambles. I mean... Pride Mage is a great example. I think the card is fine. It's in my cube. It, I think, is a perfectly reasonable two-drop. Canker Bloom also exists, and Canker Bloom is better as a base rate because it's a 3 2 instead of just a 2 2. You trade Exalted for the fact that Canker Bloom can also do other things. It can proliferate in addition to destroying an artifact or enchantment. But, like, if you were looking at those two cards in a pack, even if you were exactly green white, it still might be a decision which one to take. It's not that one is obviously better than the other. So, yeah, and I think this is a great sort of counterpoint to the fact that the gold cards don't really matter in one sense in terms of the absolute balance of the power level of different decks if run by the time-traveling supercomputer, but your cube is not drafted by the time-traveling supercomputer. It's drafted by humans that will be influenced by the signals that the cards are telling them, and Sprite Dragon says, put me in a blue-red deck and cast a bunch of spells that will point people in a direction potentially more than equally powerful cards that are in two separate colors. Yeah, because the flip side to my wishing I had a green-white gold card or a blue-black control signaling gold card to put in my cube is that there are a ton of blue-red gold cards that I adore. Like, I'm already running, I think, four or five, which is the most of any guild. I think maybe it's tied with Golgari these days, which is weird to say, because for a long time there were so few black-green cards I loved, but that was quite a few. But I run tons of gold cards in blue-red, and every single pod, someone is drafting blue-red, or two players are drafting blue-red. It is, it is a guarantee of the draft, basically, at least in our playgroup, that someone will be playing that deck. 
And for a long time, I was just like, well, it's because people like Blue Red, or because I do have these cards like Dreadhorde Arcanist or Young Pyromancer, which are further signaling that deck. But more and more, I just think it's that I have a ton of Blue Red Gold cards, and you're just going to get to like the late part of the pack and be like, well... I'm mostly blue, and now I get a free Sprite Dragon, which means I'm probably likely to get a free Third Path Iconoclast and a free Fire Ice later on. So I'm just going to take this and, and move in on it. And that just happens every draft. I mean, it's also a color pair that, not to detract from your point, but it has a lot of cards that just have very reasonable floors. Lightning Bolt's always going to be a reasonable card, so it's a very easy color pair to draft. And just take that Lightning Bolt, take that counter spell, and go from there. I think it's true of almost every color pair in the Bud Magic Cube, though. I don't have a lot of committal build-arounds. It's a lot of generically good cards that but stand But people alone. look at Lightning Bolt and they're excited about it in the way that they're not about Disfigure. Well, the reason I was going to say this is because I have added more black-green gold cards in, let's say, the past nine months. I remember I did it leading up to KubeCon. I added a couple more. I put, like, Grim Flayer in and cards I've been thinking about for a while but hadn't made the cut. And since adding a bunch of those cards, just adding more gold cards... Some of which arguably are not that good. Like, I have been a Witherbloom stand since the day it was printed, and finally, legacy players are starting to see the light. I, it's probably because the meta has changed, not because it was actually good the entire time. No, no, I'm sure you were right. <laughs> no, I think the meta has Known changed a little legacy bit. Legacy expert, is Andy. Play, It is seen play in Legacy now. But, like, you know, Witherbloom Command and Grim Flare, like, these cards are not standouts at all, power level-wise, in my cube, but... Just having more of them in there, I have seen Black Green pop up in basically every draft over the past nine months as well, even though that color combination kind of broadly panned in the sort of eternal magic context. The fact that that deck has been drafted a lot, I think is also just a factor of the number of gold cards I've put in that guild. And if you think about it, it's like, it's both good ones that pull you into the color combination, but it's also getting like the pick 12 and the pick 14 with the Boom Command and Grim Flare. And now you're going into pack two or whatever, and you're like, well, I got these for free at the end. I was mostly black or whatever. Now I have this like incentive, these like two cards I got for free essentially to like play this additional color that just recontextualizes the rest of the picks in future packs and changes what you end up drafting. So I do think the counts actually matter a lot, but not in the like you have to have exact equal amounts in every guild or this exact percentage is right for most cubes kind of way. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a really interesting point there that something that a lot of people will do with gold cards, because Wizards does this in their limited sets, is use them to signal archetypes to say, you're drafting this cube, here's a sprite dragon, cast this, cast spells, you kind of know what you're doing if you're drafting that color pair, which is absolutely true, but I think it's also interesting that they do this signaling not in terms of what should you be doing in a color pair, but what color pairs are really open. And it can be really difficult to determine that just looking at a bunch of mono-colored cards, because especially in a cube where things are potentially just uniformly, randomly shuffled up, you see one pack that's a little heavy on one color, something that's heavy on another, it doesn't necessarily send the same signals in the draft, but I think you're totally right that seeing those late gold cards lets you know that even if particular individual colors are not as open, that a color pair is really open. Yep. Which, to me, in a, in a draft, I think the biggest thing that that signals to me is that I'm going to get my fixing late if I'm confident that a color pair is open in a lot of cubes. Yeah, that also depends on the nature of the fixing, too. I mean... Yes, definitely. You're not going to get fetch lands well, super but e late. But even in cubes that... Like, in cubes where many colored decks are good, where the four and five color soup decks yeah, are good, also true. Yeah. and there's only one cycle of, you know, Shocklands or whatever, the person that's taking those over everything else so they can play all five colors is going to maybe soak up your, your fixing, too. But it's, it's definitely a better indicator, in certainly. In some cubes. <laughs> I mean, in, in the, the cubes where people are mostly playing two color decks, and there isn't necessarily that kind of very, very flexible fixing like Fetchlands. I have found that to be mostly true in the Bud Magic cube, and it's why I'm so happy with my three cycles of Shocklands, because mm -hmm. I feel like having one or two snapped up by somebody else, either because they're splashing that color and they really want to turn on their fetch lands or they're playing a greedier deck or they're speculating early. Like, that happens pretty often. But if you actually are in an open color, the chance you don't get that third shock land, it's so rare that you don't actually get that third shock land. So I, it feels like just the right number to guarantee 90% of the time if you're in an open lane, you will get your shock land even late. And it feels so good when you do. It really does. Let's talk some numbers. Is it fun to make you guess or should I just read the numbers out? Sure, make me guess. I'm looking at the Bun Magic Cube first, which is a 360 card cube. This is my primary cube. It's an eternal cube, meaning I play any card from the whole history of Magic with no restrictions other than my own dis imposed design goals. It's a very powerful cube, very low curving cube, and it's all about fair magic from my perspective. Exactly 360 cards. How many total true gold cards, hybrid cards, and in-between cards do you think I have? Non-lands. I'm going to guess 37. 41. Very close. Nice. 
So 41 is 11% of the entire cube, and that means that at the end of the draft, the average player is going to have five-ish gold cards, hybrid cards, and in-betweens in their pool. Now, again, we mentioned the hybrid doesn't really matter in the same way, and I maintain it doesn't. So if we kind of take hybrid out of the question and then look at the in-betweens, which I'll just say there's six in-betweens in my cube. It's Lingering Souls, Kellen Daring Traveler, Questing Druid, and then the three Curd Apes, Lone Lion, Curd Ape, and Wild Nacatl. Those last six cards, everyone is kind of different. Like, I think Kellen, very good in a deck without green mana. You're very happy to play that in a mono-white deck or a white-black deck or a white-red deck because the green mode of that card is not super strong. The strength is mostly in the creature side. Conversely, Questing Druid is a weird one in that if you look at the base rate of the two halves of the card, the spell side is actually the better side, I would argue. And so, if anything, it's more of a red card than a green card. But it's also interesting that it's like one of the best cards to splash in your deck. Like, if you have a little bit of green, the fact that you can play this in a deck that has almost no green spells because all of your spells are multicolored or just in other colors means you're going to trigger it all the time. So they all kind of fit in differently. Lingering Souls is very close to an actual gold card in the Bun Magic Cube. I basically never see anybody play this without a way to flash it back in the same deck. You could theoretically also play it in a deck where you don't have a way to cast the front side, but you have a lot of discard outlets and you're just going to flash it back. I basically never see those, though. So that's almost another gold card. They're all different, though. That's why there is in between section. Looking at just the true gold cards, though, you're going to have three to four per pool. That feels right for the goals of that cube. I think if I had more gold cards, the three color decks would be more prevalent because you would have more reasons to get into a third color. And I try to keep that in line with the heavy life costs on the mana base with the three copies of Shocklands and the really good aggressive decks. But I think another way to keep that in line is just to decrease the incentives for playing many colors because you won't get really good gold cards late. So three to four per pool is where I landed in the Bun Magic Cube. And yeah, that's just this is just purely observational. Like I didn't set up with that goal. This is like the result of me having curated... You just iterated based on play experience and this is where you've landed. Right. This is a piece of sea glass that I have just been rolling over in the tides of our play group for a while. And this is how many gold cards I, t- I ended up with. But it's more like it's a piece of sea glass combined with a drip castle that you're just adding to a little bit and then it gets washed around and then you add more and it's like beautiful a termite metaphor. mound. Really beautiful yeah. metaphor. <laughs> Let's jump to the regular cube, Anthony. Why don't you d- explain the regular cube briefly? It's a- Every episode is someone's first episode. Terrifying Ter- thought, Terrifying. Right? Terrifying don't, don't thought, say, right? Don't say these kinds of things and look me straight in the eyes. Uh, I'm going to need some more eggnog. Uh, nog me. Nog me, bro. Nog me. So, the regular cube is my primary cube. It is much lower power than the classic sort of Vintage Legacy style cubes. It plays a lot more like a limited set, a little bit more powered up, a little bit more synergistic. I think most closely it plays like a master set, but it's also very much designed to be accessible for our local play group, which has a big rotating cast of people that are maybe drafting magic for the first time. So, the goal is on cards that are individually easy to read that add to a lot of uh, hopefully pretty deep synergy to appeal to the more experienced players as well. And it's great at that. I have said it before and I'll say it again. I love having the regular cube in the play group for that exact reason. It is the perfect intro to cube night, cube to draft. That means a lot. Thanks. I feel like it's something we should unpack a little more. I really do think that fundamentally lower power level is actually better for new players too, even though we talk all the time about how power level is totally relative and it's like kind of useless to talk about comparing the power level of two separate cubes. I do actually think lower power level is friendlier for new drafters and that's the thing for us to maybe talk about in a future episode. Put it on the calendar. So regular cube, you are actually didn't write down the number of cards, like 452 right now? That sounds right, yeah. It's a little bigger than 450 specifically because we want enough to draft for 10 people for the same reasons. We want to be accommodating to different numbers of people at the weekly cube night. So do you want to guess how many gold cards you have in the regular cube? Again, so inclusive it's a little of true bit, gold, hybrid, and in-between. It's a little bit bigger, and also I think it's got a little bit of a higher density, especially when we're talking about those hybrids in-between. I'm going to go with 60. It's actually 69 gold cards in the regular cube, which is 15% of the cube, which means that you're getting 6 to 7 of those per pool. For you, this is... 49 true gold cards, which is a higher density than in the Bun Magic Cube by like 2 or 3%. 12 hybrid cards. You love your hybrids. I do. And then you have 8 in-betweens. And for you, this is basically all the off-color kicker and off-color activation stuff. Your Juniper Order Root Weavers and your Yavi Maya Iconoclast and your Shalai Voice of Plenty. And again, each of these cards, I think, is a completely unique story in terms of how mm-hmm. likely it is to end up in a non-gold deck of those two colors. Like... 
Uh, Rick's Mighty Reveler is one we talk about fairly often, yep. where it's pretty reasonable in a mono red deck, but if you can get that black splash, especially if you have one or two sources that are not too costly for you to pick up during the draft, it makes that card pretty great. Yeah, like Shalai, I feel like you could play without green and be perfectly happy I'm, with it. I'm delighted the rare, rare occasion I play that with green. <laughs> yeah, and meanwhile, Juniport or Root Weaver, hard to imagine not playing that with green. Right, that's, so that's a great point. They're all kind of different, which makes it hard to break down, but you're looking at four to five true gold cards in your pool in the regular cube and six to seven inclusive of hybrids and in-betweens and stuff uh, in every pool, which is a lot. I mean, I've heard the heuristic before that seven is like a good rule of thumb for the number of something you need in your deck to like have your deck matter, to have it care about that thing, to have it show up in every game. You know, every game being in big air quotes because magic is all about variance. But seven's a good number. So you can imagine that in a lot of games on the regular cube, you are seeing a gold card on both sides of the table in every game, basically, uh, because that's just the density you're running. Do you have thoughts about that? It doesn't sound like it surprises you. You kind of guess you're like, it's higher density than the bun magic cube. You you get you had a, a good sense of that. Talk about your relationship to gold cards, why you include the density you do, if you've ever thought about it in a broader sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say when I started the cube so many years ago, it was heavier even on gold cards, just because gold cards are cool. They do something pretty novel, which is that there are certain slices of the types of effects you can have in Magic that are dedicated to particular colors, and gold cards just let the designers of Magic mix and match those effects, so you aren't just getting... You know, red does direct damage and black does shrinking creatures and green gets big creatures. You get something that mixes and matches these in different ways. Plus, they look cool. They are often, you know, the signposts in limited formats, especially this where it's very much leaning on sort of those kinds of upper tier uncommons as kind of the base rate uh, for the cards in this cube. So a lot of those kinds of gold cards just make a lot of sense here. And I mean, ultimately, they're just cool. They like they look cool. It feels a little bit more specific. They're leaning into more explicit strategies, which I think is often very satisfying. So that's definitely a big part of the design of this cube. Over time, I think it's gone through maybe two big directional shifts where I was cutting back a lot because the, the biggest reason not to play a ton of gold cards is honestly just that they are more difficult to fit in your deck, especially in an environment where you're most likely going to be playing just two colors or maybe two in a splash. So you don't necessarily want the last four or five picks in every pack to be some random gold cards no one gets, no one plays. Yeah, the only possible outcomes there are you have a bunch of dead cards in the draft or a bunch of people are playing three and four colored decks right. to accommodate them. And whether or not you get either of those two outcomes, I think, depends a lot on the power level of those gold cards. But to me, neither of those outcomes are particularly appealing. Right. So I think that it sort of went down a fair amount, and then it's crept up a little bit, I think, is sort of my intuition. Partly because of just, again, that experience. We haven't necessarily had those kinds of drafts where there's just a ton of dead cards at the end of the pack. And also, I have deliberately tried to include a lot of these sort of splashable cards or cards that are somewhere in between where... You know, maybe it's not going to be the card you're most excited about, but it's a C- minus in your monocolor deck that maybe you have a light splash that allows you to access the full power of a card. Do you want to guess how the neoclassical cube stacks up to the regular cube of Magic Cube? And I see you type it over there. Don't be looking at these on Cube Cobra. Oh, I'm just looking at the regular cube on Cube Cobra, and just I'm just writing down some numbers here, doing a little a little math. Uh, so I'm going to guess that it's a lot lighter. It is. How big is it? It's somewhere in between, right? right? now, it's like, it's like 412 cards, I 412? think. 412? I cut like 50 cards like six months ago just to like pare it down a little bit. I'm going to guess 25. There are 28. You're very good at this game. Thank you. Yeah, the Neoclassical Cube is comparatively very light on gold cards. Only 28 in the entire cube, and that comes out to roughly three per pool. I should mention, for those that are listening, because the regular cube and Neoclassical Cube are not 360 card cubes, the card per pool is based on the drafted proportion, not the raw numbers. So if those numbers don't sound like they make sense c compared to the but Magic Cube, They do. That's do why. the math better. They do make sense, I promise. So you're getting only about three cards per pool. There are only three hybrid cards I run, and they're all new because that was mm -hmm. not a mechanic in uh, old school Magic. Although I think I include... Do you want to introduce this cube at all? Yeah, I guess I should say the Neoclassical Cube is my old school cube. It is... Almost entirely old border, though I allow myself to break that rule whenever I feel it is appropriate. My sort of metric is that I want all the decks to be old school magic decks, and if I need some new cards to support the old school magic deck, that's fine. I just don't want any of the decks to resemble like new school magic. And there's a lot to be discussed in terms of what accounts for old school feeling and new school feeling cards, and the like elevator pitch for that is just that in this cube, the enablers are the most powerful cards. 
synergy matters a lot, and if you want your deck to be really strong, you have to take advantage of cards that sometimes do nothing and sometimes are utterly broken. Your cards like Fast Bond, Parallax Wave, Opposition, that require you build around them, require that you have other things going on. They don't just do anything in a vacuum, but have a really high ceiling. That's kind of the play pattern I've identified for old school magic. None of the power outliers are cards that you just cast and they carry the game without any other cards to support them. So, there are eight in-betweens here, which is a substantial portion of the 28 total cards. This also includes the Curd Ape package, so that's three of those eight. And the other ones are kind of tricky, like I include Life Death, which I don't have listed as a hybrid card because I feel like casting the green side is so rare. I do have Fire Ice in this cube, and I have that listed as a hybrid card because I feel like both sides of Fire Ice are justifiable, but Life Death is almost entirely a black card that you will sometimes cast the green side of. When you start to look at what the, at the nature of those in-betweens, it's actually effectively kind of even fewer gold cards. There's only mm-hmm. 17 true gold cards in that cube, which is about two per pool per player, a little less than two per pool per player when you break down the actual drafted portion of the cube. So... It's much less of a thing there, and I maybe could have guessed this if you had asked me, and a big part of that is that, number one, gold cards used to be not as powerful as they are now. I mean, you said yeah. gold cards are cool, and I think it's worth mentioning that I think maybe Wizards has spent a lot of their gold cards are cool equity. <laughs> like I was going to say something <laughs> similar. I, I, mean, I, I don't I know if a new player to Magic has the same, like, when I started playing the game, I had this, like, fundamental feeling that, like, being a gold card was, like, something unique. There were... Tons of sets that just never had gold cards. It was like a mechanic they brought in. This set's going to have gold cards. And if you look back at Legends, one of, of, if not the first... It was the first set to have gold cards, yeah. And it was a bunch of legendary creatures that were all seven mana three threes. They were all just vanilla because... (laughs) Not totally, but a lot of them them, were. But the vast majority of them are like vanilla stats. And that's because being gold was unique and special enough. They didn't need mechanics for them to feel special relative to the other cards. I, I was not playing at this time, but I, I know LSV has talked about this on Limited Resources and probably elsewhere about how that was a feature. It's like, why am I playing this card? Because it's cool as hell that it is this gold card with a new frame and it is leaning into this different kind of mana cost. I mean, you're just looking at all the stuff on the on the card and if you're not thinking about this from a really intense game perspective on like, how am I going to win? All those pips up in the corner is a new thing and it's going to strike you in a different way as uh, uh, somebody approaching the game with fresh eyes. Yeah, I really don't think new players have that idea at all, which is not, I mean, that's just some like old man yells at cloud stuff. It's not fundamentally better to think gold cards are special versus not special. It's just of note that I think players that have been with the game for longer do have this sense of like, these are fundamentally cool and players that are new to the game are just like, these are the ground we walk on, they're yeah. everywhere. They're 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 a constant force and a constant presence. And I think that this spread of three cubes really sort of tells different aspects of that story where I totally agree they were not as present, they were much more a resource that Wizards had a lot of restraint about the way that they were designing gold cards in very old school magic, and that is reflected, you know. I think the color pie was in some ways maybe it had sort of a peak strength and it's somewhat gotten a little bit more smoothed out in recent sets and it was also a little bit wonky in the early days but somewhere in the middle maybe the color pie really was at its most defined uh, in terms of certain colors being very much about a certain thing and that stands out that a lot of those kinds of build arounds that really define what the neoclassical cube is are monocolored cards on the other end of the spectrum the bun magic cube is all about these sort of very fair but high rate efficient aggressive threats and a lot of the ones that have been printed recently Just are happen to be gold. all these gold cards that they printed, which is a, a fundamental change because, I mean, yeah, that's uh, because gold cards are cool. So they wanted to make a lot that worked that way. And they wanted to be able to bridge multiple different parts of the color pie in one card. And the regular cube is not quite in between, but it's sort of playing at, at a different part of the sort of magic landscape being more like limited is leaning into the kinds of gold cards that were designed for limited to really signal particular kinds of mechanical strategies. So we see a lot of those types of gold cards appear there. I was thinking about this recently, and I think the biggest shift that has happened in like color identity in Magic is that Magic used to be about a game of five colors. And truly, I feel like since Ravnica and the popularity of Commander, it is a game of ten guilds now. It is not really yeah, a game of five colors a, anymore. That's an interesting point. Like, just even thinking about, like, I remember when I was a kid, you would identify as, like, a color. Like, I'm, I like to play blue cards. And if you look at the vast majority of players now, people identify as guilds mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. I almost never see players be like, oh, I like this color. Because 
it just means so much less, I think. And they've, I mean, honestly, it's a testament to the success of the guilds as a design tool in Ravnica. They were, like, hugely successful for good reason. But it's really interesting to think about, like, okay, well, what what can't a guild do, right? Because if you're covering two-fifths of the color pie, right, like, you they're, kind they're, of cover almost everything with almost every color combination. Like, Rakdos used to have a hard time dealing with enchantments. It's the closest right. you can get, that was, that was but exactly now you do have what it. I was going to mention is that you can almost combine and say, like, oh, well, you can deal with... Every color has weaknesses, things it can't deal with, but almost every other color complements it in order to fully be able to interact with anything. And I think that specifically black and red not both being able to interact with enchantments was kind of the last it was the last thing absolute thing where two colors had an overlapping weakness completely and i mean that's going away for better or worse we've gotten more black enchantment removal and then maro has said we're going to continue to get more of it but i really think those are the terms in which magic is thought about talked about designed for it's like what are we giving the rakdos players in this set not what are we giving the red players and there is a difference there and again old ben yells at cloud whatever you can talk about whether it's better or worse I think it makes a ton of sense given that Commander is the most popular magic format and that the Ravnica guilds were so successful as a design pattern for Limited that it became basically ubiquitous. That just like an uncommon gold card signposts are just like how Limited works now. Yeah, which is... Like, can you imagine Limited Resources breaking down like not what a color pair wants to be doing, but what like a color wants to be doing? It's just not how people talk about the game anymore. No, and it's I don't think it's how the game really ever worked. I think in some ways it's kind of funny that I think that a lot of very enfranchised players find these kinds of implicit synergies to be a lot more satisfying. Thinking about, say, an aggressive deck that's just made of a bunch of one mana, two ones, or, you know, it's uh, 2023, so it's a one mana, two one with haste and whatever it attacks, you make a treasure and uh, exile a card from the top yeah, of your library. Yeah, yell at that cloud. Shut that, that cloud down. But, you know, you combine a lot of these cards that don't have an explicit synergy of a one mana, two one, combines a lot of one mana, two ones to make a, a strategy, but they do. It is a synergistic strategy. Right, combine counter spells and board wipes. And people don't necessarily, yeah, or counter spells and board wipes, uh, but people aren't as excited, the really infan- franchise players often buy, you know, whenever you put a plus one plus one counter on a thing, draw a card, or whenever you s- surveil, put a plus one plus one counter on this thing, these kinds of really explicit synergies that are just written on the cards, what they do. I, I don't know. I think actually, maybe I think, di- I think maybe a much bigger different. factor is just the power level of it. When those cards are the most powerful cards in a limited set, I feel like I that see franchise players talking about how fun and cool and awesome they are and how much they love them all the time. I'm thinking of, like, Roost of Drakes, right? Yeah. Like, that card was beloved, That's true. That's and true. it was, like, a very, like, blatant play cards with kicker, but because it was good, the, the good players I mean, liked it. Was, it. it was good in a way that you could just be like, yeah, I got this game now, I'm, I'm going to take my time, and I'm just going to make Drakes forever, and you can never win, and I'm going to bury you. Yeah, but I think it comes down to, and franchise players can often see that, in many contexts, the explicit synergy is not the strongest thing. Mm-hmm. It, there's actually sure. a stronger so thing underneath it. just seeing more of the menu. Exactly. Okay. And when the strongest thing is the explicit synergy, I don't think franchise players are like, well, this is boring. I think they like to do the really synergistic thing when it works. Yeah. It's just that, I mean, again, this is really broad, really broad statements here, but I think ultimately it comes down to just like, what's actually the strongest thing to be doing? Sure. But I, the connection that I wanted to make was just that I think that there's a similar thing that happens in the implicit synergies between colors that are explicitly defined by a lot of gold cards. So, say, for example, we're thinking about older school magic. If you have green that can make big creatures, you can combine that with black, which has good removal, to say, I'm going to clear out your blockers, deal with your big threats, and attack you with my big creatures. Or I'm going to combine that with card draw in blue so that I can play my creatures, trade them off, and then refill my hand and play more creatures. Or I'm going to combine that with white to have uh, some more aggressive threats to play a mid rangey deck and also some unconditional things like Oblivion Ring. So there's still all these ways that you could combine the colors to make strategies that were unique to the interactions between the parts of the color pie that those colors had access to, but it wasn't necessarily as visible. And I think that visibility has changed the way that people talk about it, where I agree, people definitely identify as guilds now. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of a little bit of a side tangent, but the Neo Classical Cube is much lighter on gold cards. Oh, right. I, we're talking about that. I think it's for a couple of reasons. One is what we just kind of went in great depth about, which is that gold cards used to be different in old school magic, and I want to capture that. I don't want to have a bunch of interchangeable gold cards running around because they're so ubiquitous now. I want them to be somewhat special and just fewer and further between in that cube. The other maybe bigger factor is that I also want to limit the strength of many colored decks in that cube, but that cube, critically, does not have the 3x shock lands that the Bun Magic Cube has, and it does not have the same ruthless aggressive decks that the Bun Magic Cube has. And so in terms of tools I have at my disposal to make the many colored decks worse, I'm pretty much just down to like 
making the incentives not as strong, right? Mm-hmm. So because the enablers are the most powerful things, I'm so down if you want to draft a three-color deck that combines a couple of enablers in really novel ways. I just don't want you jamming generic, powerful threats. And so a big part of that is making sure that like the gold cards are not generic, powerful threats. There just aren't that many of them, and they require some synergy or whatever to make any sense. So much later on gold cards in that cube. <laughs> Anthony, I want to introduce a thought technology. Oh, no. I usually hate doing this stuff, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot here just to see how, it, how it's received. I think that gold cards can't be broken down into one of three S's. Signposts, splashables, and scraps. Signposts are what we've been talking about. These are substantially better than mono-covered equivalents. They are opinionated and somewhat narrow. They indicate what the color should be doing. They're not just like generically great cards that go in any kind of deck. They should be the reason to be in a specific color combination in a cube, and I think they're a great place for a, like, power outlier, to have just a really powerful card that stands above the rest of the cards in the cube is better suited to a, like, a gold signpost slot than it is to just, like, a random red two-drop being the best thing to do at two mana in the entire cube. Splashables, I think, are also better than their monocolored equivalents, maybe not substantially better, but better than their monocolored equivalents. They are generically powerful, which means they're oftentimes removal or something. I'm thinking of like your abrupt decays and your K commands and stuff like that. These are often, I think, the reason to splash a third or fourth color. Maybe you picked up a couple speculative fixing lands, then you get a late K command and you just decide, all right, I'm going to be Grixis instead of just blue red or whatever because you have the ability to cast it. And that's where these splash bills come in. I think here it's probably good to avoid true power outliers, cards that are just like cracked and can go in any deck because then it kind of... It's just a freebie, but that's more of a design value than it is a sort of observation about what the cards do. Then you have scraps, and these are just cards that I think are as good or maybe even worse than their monocolored equivalents, which I think some cube designers would say you should just not include. And for the most part, I do think your gold cards should be better than their monocolored equivalents, but I've started to really see these as an important design tool because they are very likely to wheel, and I'm just looking at them as rewards to somebody for staking out a color pair. If you stake out a lane, here are some cards you're going to get for free. And I think having some rewards there is a great way to encourage a deck that might not otherwise go drafted because you just get this stuff for free. So like in my own cube, I mentioned Grimflayer before in Black Green. I've got Tarmogoyf. Is Grimflayer better than Tarmogoyf? No. In almost no games is Grimflayer better than Tarmogoyf. Tarmogoyf is going to be bigger all the time by definition, correct? Because Delirium is four card types, so it's going to be at least a 4-5 by the time Grimflayer is a 4-4, so it's always bigger. Just heading off the feedback at the pass here, obviously if you have no card types in either graveyard or just one card type in either graveyard, then the Tarmogoyf is smaller than the base rate 2-2 on the Grim Flayer, so you can definitely have a board state where the Tarmogoyf is worse base stats. Just very unlikely, at least in the Bun Magic Cube. It doesn't have Trample or the other triggered ability, but those things often don't matter when you don't have the beef you need. But I think it's actually okay to have Grim Flayer in this cube because it encourages you to be playing specifically black green when otherwise you might be playing some other color combination. Another example that people are always telling me to cut. I'm always being told to cut Lightning Helix because it's just as good as Lightning Strike more or less, right? Like the three life gain, how much does it actually matter? I like including that because I and, think... And you're known as a lover of lifelink and life gain in general. I, I do not love life gain, but I think maybe people overstate that sometimes. I really hate repeatable life gain that can just like completely negate a race. I think incremental life gain here and there could be kind of interesting. And Helix is a great example of a card that I think is a gold card that definitely is in this scraps category in that like you're just going to get it late if you're red white because nobody else is going to be able to play it. You might maybe be able to splash it. Maybe it's kind of like edging into the splashables category, but... I really like having that there as a way to reward controlling decks that are playing red, which oftentimes doesn't happen in my cube because red is so aggressive. The blue-red decks can be very aggressive. Where if you want to go Jeskai Control, this is a little treat for you. You should get this late. You should get a late Lightning Helix in Jeskai Control. The three life, that's also a little treat for you. Like, here's a little bit to buoy your life total against all those shock lands. So I think even I would have said maybe a year or two ago that I would try and avoid all of these scraps, and now I see them as a very important design tool. Do you think those three S's are reasonably comprehensive and 
descriptive? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very comprehensive because like so many of these kinds of magic heuristic acronyms, your last category is just all the other stuff, <laughs> which I don't I mean, love I'm about... specifically defining it as cards that are uh-huh. worse than their monocolored equivalents. All right, so, so I'm, I'm over here on, on Power Thesaurus. The fact that you've, you've locked us into three S's has made this a lot more difficult. I was difficult. also on Power Thesaurus <laughs> earlier. So it could be your subsidies or maybe your stipends. I played around or, with so likely to wheel. Or sweet <laughs> treats. As you suggest, sort of. <laughs> but yeah, I, th- I think broadly it's like, okay, are the gold cards better enough than their monocode equivalents that you're like drawn to them? And if so, are they a signpost or are they splashable? Because that will dramatically change what kinds of decks will want them, how highly they'll be taken. If they're worse than the monocolored cards, they're the scraps and they should just be rewards for being that color combo. Now, you could put a card that is so bad in your deck that even if you are in exactly black green and you get this card for free 15th pick, you still don't put it in your deck. And at that point, you probably just have a wasted space, right? That's probably just a slot that could be anything else that you're just playing a card that's too below rate. But I actually feel like there is a space for these scraps, these cards that are just as good as monocolored cards because they can really help nudge a player in the direction of a specific color combination in adequate number. So is your full criticism just that one of the categories... I mean, to be clear, that category can't contain anything that's better than yeah. monocolored equivalents. Mm-hmm. I'll think about it. Listeners, the three write in the S's. comments about the three S's. I like that it's got three and we're talking about cube, even though I don't think this is specifically a cube heuristic. Maybe it is. I guess I it mean, is. I mean, I think it, it's specific to draft. I mean, you could definitely look at the gold cards in a limited set and say... But you wouldn't be thinking about it from those perspectives. You would you're just not be like, a which set. card is good? Yeah, exactly. I will take the ones that win me games, which do, is, you know, obviously a lot more nuanced than that, but... I, I do want to touch briefly here on a slightly different way to describe gold cards that I've heard before. I don't know who to credit this with. If you are listening and you know who first coined these terms, please let me know. I've just seen them bouncing around forums for six years, which is that gold cards can also be grouped into like reasons and rewards. They are either reasons to be in that color combination or rewards for being in that color combination. And the the context I often see this in is people saying they want their gold cards to be reasons to be in that color combination and not rewards. They don't want any of these cards that you just get for free on the wheel. Which I, I can understand, right? Because you should, I think, for the most part, want your gold cards to be more appealing options than people could otherwise have access to in monocolored decks. But I think if you stick to that too strictly, then you end up in a situation where you're letting the cards dictate how your cube should be played more than having actual influence as a designer. So that's another way to think about this is just reasons versus rewards and whether or not you want your players to wheel a really late gold card in their color combination is a question for you to answer as a designer. I would just add that I don't think it's universally bad. I think it could actually be nice to give people a reward for staking out that color combination and actually reading the table correctly. Yeah, I mean, I feel a little bit better, honestly, sort of the state of of some of the color pairs in my main cube is there's a little bit of filler in there that I kind of just just needed a couple more cards to make it feel not wildly asymmetrical even though I mean I, River Hoopoo does see play River even Hoopoo does is, do stuff or yeah. one that I like really stands out to me is Poison Tip Archer which is a card that yeah, that's nobody gets excited that's about scrap. but and people don't put it in their main deck either but people end up just bringing this out of their oh, sideboard all deck. the time and it's, it's a pretty just, good card it's still. a much better card than it looks and it ends up just I think giving uh, that color pair black green a little bit more legs than people think it has which is interesting it's something i think it's really cool when you as a designer can hide a gold card in the scraps in this third category that your players are not going to evaluate highly and then when they get the games they're like oh i'm so glad i have this yeah like i didn't think i wanted this but actually i do really want this and it patches a hole that my deck had that i didn't even know that it had that's a really cool place to be as a cube designer i think if you can actually give them that tool and i think poison departure is kind of that i mean i think people that haven't played the regular cube before might severely underestimate how good the flying keyword is because yes. reach death touch like really cleanly and four sort toughness of, and right only three toughness, three toughness. but uh, and then I'm it also my has Legolas's and my poison tip archers confused and then it also has a little bit of a blood artist type effect which is something that I think kind of draws people into trying to do something with this card or maybe splashing green in a black red deck so it's it's there for some reasons I think it works but in the context of gold cards yeah it's kind of interesting as this like surprising c plus do you have any thoughts on gold cards anthony i do think we should talk about hybrid cards a little bit more specifically can you read your seven words of notes to me no um go please <laughs> well one of them was hybrid all just, on its, it's own just line. hybrid well yeah the, 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 all the notes right up here in my noodle all right hybrid cards are not gold cards in the same way all these other cards say you must be playing this color and this color hybrid cards say you must be playing this color or this color 
or an and are not the same. They are opposites. Uh, so hybrid cards are actually just much more flexible. You can put... I mean... Well, I'm going to get there. Okay. Okay. You can put your Nature's Chant in your mono green deck or your mono white deck in a way that you can't with Classic Naturalize. It's just a more flexible card, which... I think it's actually relevant in the context of talking about gold cards and, you know, what's going to be left over at the end of the draft, things like that. Putting in more hybrid cards kind of buys you extra space where here are more flexible things, especially if they are like narrower sideboard cards that some decks will want some amount of, or maybe just kind of like filler effects. You want at least one way to deal with enchantments, perhaps in your cube. This is an option. And it means that then you can spend a few more slots, if you will on more narrow things on gold cards because that flexible card will get to the people who need it. Similar to colorless cards that are just a little bit more flexible in terms of how they're fitting into decks. So gold cards, not hybrid cards, opposite thing. Two big caveats. They look like gold cards. So people are going to look at that green, white hybrid card and mm -hmm. be more comfortable drafting it. They're just going to see that and be like, yep, there's another green, white card. I'm putting that in my green, white deck. The other thing is the actual distribution of the mana cost matters. If it's just one end, a green or a white, sure, that is just strictly an easier to cast thing than uh, one and a white for your classic disenchant. But if you have really aggressive mana cost, I'm thinking like, think back to Eldraine or the Ravnica sets where you have like hybrid, 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 four hybrid costs. These are kind of their own beast where the point of those cards was not to make things that are more flexible that can fit into more decks, but to specific specifically push drafters into playing exactly two colors because... Uh, I think it was more playing either of the mono colors or maybe those two colors. Or those two. No, I mean... Ravnica was designed to be a multicolored set where players were motivated Did to play Ravnica exactly have the two ones? colors. I think you're thinking of the first Eldraine when there was the cycle of hybrid, 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 hybrid. Sure, sure, sure. Those might have been there, but in the original Ravnica, you know, you had the guild mages that were just two mana but of two pips. It's still that high okay. devotion that's going to push you into a particular direction. And those are not really flexible in the same way because maybe the easiest one to, to talk about is Figure of Destiny because this ends up getting played in a lot of cubes. This has this activation cost that is really intense hybrid. And you can put that in a mono white deck. You can put that in a mono red deck. It fits and works the same in either or in a Boros deck, but you can't splash it in the same way you put any other red card into your red-blue deck because you need full red. Like every every one of your cards, every one of your lands needs to be able to make red mana. So those are kind of a twist on the hybrid that really are trying to push players in a particular direction. So think about how you're addressing those. You kind of got to the thing I was going to say, but okay. not quite. Well, do your thing then. All I was going to say is that while it's true that they are not gold cards and they can be played in either deck, they are fundamentally always much more castable in both colored decks, right? That is true. Like your nature's chant in your. Yeah, I said that. It's no, easier to you cast. Didn't say that. It's always easier your to nature's, cast. Your nature's chant in your white black deck is not as good as your nature's chant in your green white deck because you're, you can always cast your that nature's chant in your green white deck. You don't have to draw one of your colors. You have to draw either color, which will happen every game if you're playing Magic. You will draw one of your two colors. So they are better in their actual color okay, pairs you're right. than they are in decks that are playing just one of the two colors but it's not much better so for the most part another thing i had a question about was just we, we talked a little bit about these partial gold cards what about things that have colorless cycling or land cycling where do you where do you categorize those kind of things this is obviously very much just a, a detail for the aside, purposes but... of these numbers i just counted them as i mean they're never gold cards they could be mm -hmm. colorless cards but they're never gold cards well it could be a gold card with a two mana generic cycling i don't think either of us have any of those in any of our cubes. And now it's time to talk about the turbo cube. <laughs> you do have them. They're, they're abundant in the turbo cube, but I don't think you have any in the cubes okay, that I crunch numbers on. That is that is correct. Yeah, I guess just generally, do you have suggestions on how to categorize or think about those? Again, I think it's just sort of this blurry space and where... Every single one of them is like an individual yeah. case. You have to figure out for yourself. And also, categorizing them is only so useful. It is really focus on the play experience and the way that people are drafting. Yeah, like... I actually sort my gold cards into different categories based on my like based on vibes like vibes like I did not consider lingering souls a true gold card for the purposes of these numbers but it is in my gold section because practically it is mostly going to see play in a black white deck I have thought about putting questing druid in my red instance section because I think that is where it is most likely to get played I think it's almost never going to happen that you're going to play that card if you can't cast the adventure side just playing Query and Druid in 2023 does not make sense. Query and Dryad? Druid? Dryad? Query and Dryad, I think is what it is. Yes. Just the creature side of that spell, I don't think, works Wait. in the Bun Magic Cube in 2023. So I think you have to at least be able to cast the red side, and the green side is kind of like gravy. 
But I also don't think if someone was looking at my cube, they would think to look for Questing Druid in the red instance. So I think right now I have it in the gold cards. It's imperfect science. It's it's hard to categorize some of these things. And everyone's just a unique use case. I, I guess my big takeaways from this are just that I am more okay today than I would have been a couple years ago with gold cards that are not necessarily much better than their monocolored equivalents and using those as a reward for someone staking out a deck or being willing to draft a color combination that maybe a lot of players don't want to draft very often. Like, okay, fine, you don't want to draft black-green? Here's a bunch of rewards for the one player that's willing to do that. And also, those raw counts, just including more cards that are of reasonable power level, they don't even have to be, like, better than your monocolored options. Just any cards that are, like, playable in your environment, just putting more in specific guilds, it sounds really blunt and obvious, but I think it's a really good way to get people to play that deck more. Even if, you know, even if you look at all those cards and you say, well, with the Moon Command and Grim Flayer are not that appealing. There's not going to be reasons to get into green, black. My experience is that people will just end up doing it. Like, it'll just happen because they'll get them late and they'll decide to go into that deck or whatever. So those are Blunt. my two recent revelations, I feel like, around gold cards. Recent as in within like the past year that have been guiding my cube design decisions. Turns out blunt, obvious tools will have a blunt impact. I mean, a, a great example is the new card from Lost Caverns of Ixalan, Anim Pakal, which is fine. Is it better than Goblin Rabble Master and Adeline? I think it's worse than Adeline, a little better than Rabble Master, but like that's you're splitting hairs there. It's not like if I was if I had taken all red cards and then in pack four I see a Goblin Rabble Master and an, and a Anim Pakal. It's probably not good enough for me to actually commit to the second color because of Anim Pakal. So Anim Pakal is in this scraps category for me. But it's good enough that when you get it, now you have another three drop in your deck that is a similar power level to Rabble Master or Adeline. And that's really good for that deck. So it's, it's a reward for being willing to actually play like a red-white aggro deck or a red-white something aggro deck, which I'm perfectly happy with right now. The last word in my notes was three. What? <laughs> that is horseshit. How was I ever going to guess that? Well, I don't know. Do you think it's worth mentioning briefly three color cards, or is that an entirely separate topic? Was that not covered in all this discussion we just had? Well, no. I think the thing that we didn't really touch on is a lot of people will say, I want my drafters to play three color decks, so I feel like I need to add three color gold cards to get them to do that. And... Yeah, that's more two color gold cards that's not true. in the three colors you want them to play is <laughs> yeah. the better way to do it. I um, think there are definitely some that are cool cards, and if they're individual cool cards that you like, go for it. But I think that that specific logic isn't the best way to get players into those kinds of decks. Yeah, when you're in that scraps category, you really cross a line between two and three color cards. Where get that Grim Flare late, and I'm playing black green. Awesome. What are the chances I'm already playing the three colors, and also I'm sitting in the seat that it happens to get the I don't know Kaikar the cinder wind late right like a lot has to align for that card to actually see play and have your players not just make the assessment that any card i'm more likely to be able to cast is a better choice in this spot yeah i mean it depends in a lot of contexts a three color card can be a, a big power outlier because a lot of these cards are designed to do a lot of stuff like that is an aggressive mana cost so wizards will scale the power level appropriately people will enjoy drafting a siege rhino or a cast dissident mage in the right context i want to Jeskai gold card that costs Jeskai white, blue, red, and it's just Monastery Mentor with Flash. That'd be messed up. I want it. That'd be so much better than Monastery Mentor. <laughs> I mean, it's. I don't think. I don't. I think don't think that card would see adds... eternal play. Let's put it that <laughs> sure, way. Sure. Yeah, that's like, probably fair. I, I, and this is such a stupid thing to do an interjection about, but it occurred to me in editing that I think actually the biggest upgrade on that card from an Eternal Magic perspective, is that it's now a Monastery Mentor that pitches to Force of Will. Maybe that makes it good enough. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. You know, Monastery Mentor hasn't really seen Eternal play in a substantial way for a long time either. I don't think it's, like, way better. I just think it would be a really cool reward for being a Jeskai Control deck, is all I'm saying. Have you considered playing Scout's Warning? Yeah, I actually have. It's yeah. been on the board for a long time. Right up there with Quicken. All right, it is... 4.59 p.m. here on the East Coast, which means that this dog, who has been paying tons of attention to us for the past 30 minutes, really wants to eat dinner, which means it's time to end this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for the eggnog, Max. This is delicious. Yeah, Max, shout we, out to we the, drank the shout whole out jar. Shout out We drank the whole jar. I don't know how much alcohol I have, but I definitely feel a little buzzy. Yeah. So I guess this is our like official Ubercube tribute <laughs> podcast where we're uh, giving a shout out to our friends over at Ubercube, who uh, always 
talk about Cube with a, what do they say, with a refreshment? Cubing, Cube but with, with refreshments. refreshments. I do have a small bone to pick with Uber Cube because they say, well, we talk about Cubing, but with refreshments, which is, you know, that sort of exception to the that rule we thing. we don't always have refreshments. Which we don't usually when we're recording the podcast. But we what always I'm, have water. What I'm, yeah, water right here. <laughs> Tito's water. Oh, sorry. Sorry, part of the dog. Dog of the pod. But, you know, when we're playing Cube, I'm going to have a refreshment. (laughs) Shots fired, I guess, in the great Cube podcast war. Anthony says he sometimes (laughs) has a refreshment, too. Really, really strong, strong bone to pick. The Cube podcast with refreshments. (laughs) If, If that's our biggest quarrel, I think we're doing pretty well. And on that bombshell, that's the end of this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. Happy New Year to everybody out there listening. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This podcast is produced by Anthony and I, thinking really hard about magic cards and then speaking into microphones about it. And getting fully nogged up. That's what the kids call it, I'm pretty sure. Is drinking nog chuggy? I've I've never heard anybody say that except for... I did hear someone say, unironically say Chugi recently, and I was like, oh, it was, I, was, I was like, I was like, the thing that I hear is them it, talk about ironically even on a, a thing on, that is talked about Vista. not on Australian podcasts. Oh, it's, it's like a, it's a Zoomer thing. It's not an okay. Australian thing at it's all. It's not an Australian thing. Yeah. I think Zoomers are saying Chugi all the time. Okay. It's not like the Riz. At least the Riz has like an etymology you can remember. Do you know what the Riz is? Uh, he's. Um, no, it's just short for chari- it's short for charisma. You got oh. the Riz if you're charismatic. Riz, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Rizza. Yeah, it's, it's not Rizza. It's not no, Rizza. It's not, it's not related. It's not member of the Wu Tang Clan. The I was Rizza. Like, I was gonna say Wu Tang Clan. Wu Tang Clan. Wu Tang Clan. But if I got it wrong, it'd be really embarrassing. Fortunately, I didn't you get didn't. anything. But then wrong. you did say Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> I'm blaming the nog. Anyway, Chugi looked it up. No, no useful etymology. It just it's a word that we don't do that anymore. I mean, sometimes we do. Don't Riz. we have Urban Dictionary that does that careful etymology of new words? I mean, yeah, that's why I know what the Riz is. What are you asking me? I feel like I'm being bullied here. I didn't make up Chugi. Stop being so Chugi. Um, you want to give me something at the volume at which you intend to speak? We're, so hard, we're, so hard to figure out how loud I'm going to speak. Say a thing. Say anything. Anything at all. Uh, we're making eggnog. I wish I could do a great David Lynch impression. I can tell you were trying. Does that yeah. is that a consolation? We're making quinoa. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I think you need him to actually. You actually need to hear him say, "We're making." Yeah, eggnog I have listened to that can. possibly. It's been a couple years since I've listened to David Lynch say, we're making quinoa. Can I make an intro for that? That's like, we're making a cube. We're making cube. We're going to find out.